Welcome to Behind the Bearcat. This is the podcast where the Northwest Missouri State University Career Services Office chats with Northwest faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends to hear about their career journeys, how they got to Northwest, and how they became Bearcats. I'm Career Services Assistant Director Travis Klein. And I'm Hannah Christian, the Director of Career Services here at Northwest. And today's guest on our show... Um, I'm uh, Jesse Lane. I just uh, started here last fall, and I'm a assistant professor of geography in the humanities and social sciences department. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Jesse. Yeah, yes, very, welcome. very glad to have you on the show. Um, typically, what we talk about um, involves, you know, how you got to where you are now. But first, um, as an assistant professor of geography, could you talk about what you teach here and maybe your background a little bit? Sure. Um, so uh, here specifically, I'm a utility player. I, uh, they, the department brought me in to, to take over the intro, intro courses, and that's uh, been my specialty. I've, I've taught some level of introduction to geography or human geography or physical geography for uh, well, since 2014. And um, so I teach a lot of incoming freshmen and um, overall I'm a, a general methods and uh, economic geographer. So I've published some articles using both quantitative and qualitative data. So they wanted me to take over as the uh, research methods guy as well. And again, I teach economic geography. Exciting. We're actually starting a new sustainability program, uh, minor. So I'll be teaching sustainable economic development and uh, um, geography of the global south. Uh, a couple of new courses that we're going to start in 2014, uh, 2024, 2014. I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, uh, and I came from the uh, my alma mater is the University of North Alabama. And that's actually where I first heard of Northwest. <laughs> and uh, we spent a lot of time there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'll never forget the, uh, um, the 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 second round of the playoffs, and I don't remember when it was, but I think Northwest ended up going to either winning or losing in the 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 final game, but the national championship. But I know that UNA it was the first time we did we'd made it in the second round of the playoffs in a few years. And so when they said it was going to, we were going to play Northwest Missouri state, I was like, where is that? And uh, the team was going away. So everybody was rooting for UNA and it snowed in Maryville. And when it did, I told all my friends, Oh, we're going to lose. We don't know how to play in the snow. And we did, we got our butt stomped. So that was my first experience of Northwest. Um, so uh, and you moved yeah. here anyway, despite the snow. <laughs> Well, um, I, I do love I do love to watch sports, and I was a baseball coach in high school for years, and a football coach. But uh, I'm not big on uh, holding grudges, and I'm not really even a fan of a particular team. So um, I guess you call me a fair weather fan. I just whatever wherever I'm <laughs> a utility living, utility player. That's what I like. I'll play for whatever team will have me. Go Kansas City. So uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so I, I, I taught. Um, I got my bachelor's in social studies, secondary education at the University of North Alabama, and uh, it was right when the economy crashed in 2007, 2008, financial crisis, and so it was tough finding a job, teaching. Um, I did long-term subbing from place to place for a few years and then decided to go back and get a master's. Um, I really liked my geography courses, and with a, with a specialty in GIS, to geographical information systems, and science, sciences, it depends on who you talk to, whether they say systems or sciences, but um, um, that I could go get a job outside of education if the market hadn't rebounded yet. And uh, is, no matter, I found this out, no matter how hard you try to beat the teacher out of oneself, you can never really escape. <laughs> so um, I went down to uh, Daphne High School and uh, taught uh, AP human geography there for a couple of years, coached football and baseball, and then got offered a scholarship at the University of North Carolina at uh, Greensboro and finished up my PhD there. Went back to teach um, a visiting lecture position at the University of North Alabama, and then I came here. So, so have you, did you always want to be a teacher? I mean, obviously your undergrad degree is in education. Uh, that's a good question. No. No, uh, um, I'll, I wanted to be an architect. I was uh, fascinated with old architecture 
and um, I wanted to be the next Frank, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but I, you know, of course, I didn't realize at the time when I was a kid that Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, engineering was uh, less than optimal. Questionable, and, yeah. <laughs> so, but we had a Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, the Rosenbaum house in Florence, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, designed it. And, and I was always fascinated with that. Uh, the, um, oh God, I can't remember the name of it, but whatever the uh, rolling waters or the, the, the his mm -hmm. famous building, uh, apparently water. they're having to, yeah. uh, they're apparently they're having to uh, update it every year because it's falling apart. But um, yeah, I was fascinated with that. And then I didn't do too well in physics. And I thought, you know, if I can't understand physics, I probably shouldn't be uh, designing buildings people are going to work in. So, uh, <laughs> that's good self-actualization there. <laughs> like, hey, Jesse maybe. just saved half the population. We didn't even <laughs> know it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, and I, I was kind of on a, a trip of self-actualization, uh, you know, trying to figure out my, who I am as a person. And I took, like, I dropped out of school for a semester and then went back and took a class and, um, the second half of U.S. history at uh, UNA, your intro courses were world history, so mm -hmm. you didn't have to take intro. You didn't have to take um, U.S. history unless you wanted to. And so I took second half. And I really loved that class, and I remember going to my history professor and I said, "Hey, um, how do I do what you do?" And he said, 10 more years of school." <laughs> and I was like, at the time, I was twenty two. I said, "I I don't think I can do that. I can't afford that." So he said, well, you can do what I do and get a degree in education. So um, that's that's teach for a little while and then go back to school. That's essentially what he told me. And so that's what I did. I, I, it's funny because I had a friend, well, I say friend, friend of me in middle school <laughs> that uh, we got an argument one day about how much we uh, liked this one teacher. And I was I was I was always having behavior problems at that age. So. Um, I told him I hated this teacher and he looked at me and he says, you're going to be a teacher someday because you said that. And I was like, no, I'm not. Never. And, <laughs> he cursed uh, you to your profession. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. I appreciate that. <laughs> so coaching, how did you get into that? Was that something you were always interested in or did it just a lot of times you do see social science, especially education. Those folks do coach a lot of times. Was that something that, that you'd always had in the back of your head, your mind, or did you just kind of fall into it when you became a teacher at a high school? Um, actually, it was antithetical to my beliefs on the importance of education. Okay. But um, if you're, you know, it's, it, it may be softening now, but when I graduated, if you're a male social studies uh, educator in the state of Alabama, you're expected to coach football. Um, and so even though I'd never touched a football other than to throw it around with friends, I played three seasons of baseball. Um, my, and, uh, and Hannah knows this, my dad was a, a head baseball coach at the University of North Alabama for 30 years, He'd, Hall of Fame, everybody knew Coach Lane. And so when I graduated, uh, there were schools that were asking if I'd be interested in coaching. And they won't admit this, but not because of my knowledge. I think they really wanted dad to like be around to help. Um, and so I did it and dad helped as much as he could, but you know, um, he had retired by that point. He wasn't really worried about that. So I, I did what they asked me to do because I really needed a job. Um, and my last school, I found actually a great position because I, I was essentially told in um, no uncertain terms by the vice president principal that he said so are you going to take the coach the head coach up on that job to coach defensive backs and for the freshman team I said well yeah I'm, I'm thinking about it and he looked at me pulled me off to the side and he says you know a lot of people would love to have this position so I'd do anything uh, that I could to keep it and I said oh I guess I'm coaching football <laughs> so um, I coached defensive backs knew nothing about it uh, but I learned how to uh, teach kids how to weave um and uh zigzag um and i did that for a year but then we had a new a new round of coaches come in um daphne i don't know if you remember a few several years ago uh hoover high school won the the, the state championship in alabama and like mtv created a, a a reality tv show behind the scenes of of hoover high school and they lasted one season. And the reason why they didn't go on is because they lost the, the next state championship to Daphne. 
So that was our claim to fame. We ruined Hoover's TV show. <laughs> so um, so it was a big deal. Football was a big deal. Um, when the new coaches came in, they didn't hire a kicking coach. And so the kickers were up there just kicking balls and playing with each other and not really following directions. So, and we had three DB coaches now at this point. I said, well, what do I need to be down here for? I'm really not doing anything but picking up balls. So I went up to the coach and I said, hey, can I be the kicking coach? I mean, that there's a lot, there's a lot of similarities in arc of baseball, of a, of a, a, a swinging a baseball bat and kicking a ball. And I knew more about kicking than I did about DBs. So I did that and we had a, we actually had an all state kicker and I got to coach him that his uh, first year in varsity. And so that was nice. He ended up going, he got a full scholarship to some university. I think it's Tennessee, but I don't want to say that and be wrong, but um, um, he, at 16 years old, he could kick it through the uprights and the kickoff. So wow. this kid was, uh, was a beast, but anyways, no, I, I didn't really intend to coach, but I did. And I found ways to love it in some ways. Sometimes I hated it, but. I love this. This is like, how do you, how do you get your next job? You're like, well, here's your job. Take it. And you're like, okay, well, (laughs) I will. (laughs) Yeah. And I think the expectation to coach is very true here as well in Missouri. You know, I know people who've graduated with, with that same degree, the social science education, and it's just expected that you're going to coach something, whether it be basketball or football. We don't have a lot of baseball here in Northern Missouri very often, but um, you know, it's, it is kind of an expectation that you, you coach with that as well. And I know I've, I've had friends that have also been like, I don't want to coach. Like, that's not what I went to school to do. So. Yeah. I'd, I had a, um, uh, a friend that was educated in educate. Well, he, he got his education degree out of, uh, some university in California and, and he had, uh, he always wondered why we set it up the way we do in Alabama. Like I had something to do with that, but, um, but in some California schools, they actually have separate coaching staffs like they do at universities. So you're not, except for maybe the assistant coaches. So you're not expected to do both. And also they have a lot more funding in in, in the public education sphere than, than in Alabama. But I, I remember, um, I just, the reason why I opposed it for myself philosophically was because I remember in my years in high school, I had some, and not all of them, uh, football coaches and baseball coaches that prioritize the sport over education. And so I missed out on a lot. And I was fortunate enough to have a, a history teacher for my 10th and 11th grade year that was also a, an adjunct instructor at UNA. And so he had like, and he didn't coach anything. And so I had this, you know, psychological um view of quality of instruction based on that again that doesn't mean that there weren't really good but just in my experience it wasn't very good and so I just didn't want to do that but um you know when I was at Daphne all the history and social studies male teachers coached football and, and or another sport and they did a great job so you know I guess it just depends on where you go can you tell me some of the major differences maybe in teaching at the high school level and teaching and and what you do now in being an assistant professor? Um, or similarities, similarities, differences? No, that's, that's a good question. So I've tried to sort of uh, figure this out because I it, it, it may be unfair for me to compare completely because I was teaching at a, at a blue ribbon school, baccalaureate uh, institution, and I was very spoiled. I always tell them, because I have a lot of uh, of education majors in my intro courses over the years and every, you know, UNA, UNCG as well. Um, I always tell them, don't wish for the, the, the cushy classroom first. You need to go to some place where they don't, where the students don't listen to you, the parents don't care, because it teaches you how to uh, adjust your teaching style to, to fit that particular group if you go to a place where um like i did my final year um i was lucky because i started in a school system in rural northwest alabama and it was just um uh, working on the farm was more important than going to school which is understandable that was their source of income um and so it was an uphill battle a lot to get people students i mean they behaved because mama would take care of them when they got home if they didn't behave but um, doing their schoolwork was another issue. 
it wasn't a priority. But um, uh, comparatively, there is a major difference. First of all, I can, um, I, especially when it comes to the upper level classes, there's no way. We had a conversation about Thomas Kuhn and, and scientific paradigms the other day in, in my uh, research methods course. If I brought that up to my high school students, they would have just zoned out. And um, I, it would have it, it would have been somewhat of a struggle to talk about that kind of thing. So there's the benefit of that that there's a higher level of maturity in the upper level courses, but and I, and some students may hate to hear this, but the maturity level of a 17 year old is not much different than a 19 year old. So, um, but it is a learning process, and they're on the road to learning that um, how to be an adult. So you see, like a big change between the first three days of class and the last three days of class. And so that's good. A change in behavior that I never saw in high school because mm. there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, an evolution into adulthood in the high school setting. Um, I like FERPA. I know people don't, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people feel that same way, but if a parent, contacts me which i haven't had that here but i did in alabama a couple of times and in north carolina as well um but i don't have to deal with that and that's that's really a, a big change is that i would have to respond within 24 hours to a parent request for a conversation about grades um, wasn't i never really had much of an issue so it wasn't a big deal but i know teachers have had nightmarish stories about dealing with parents um, and so I don't have to deal with that. So that's good. Um, level of competency in the upper level courses is, um, is way better than high school students. I don't know. I don't know if I really answered the question. There's a lot of similarities, uh, but there's also a lot of differences and it really just depends on what you're teaching, I, I suppose. One of the things we like to do on the podcast is advice for students, maybe who want to be educators or something like that. So as someone who's been through the process, taught at both high school and college level, any advice you'd have for students who are maybe going into it, things that you wish you would have known or things that you did that maybe you do differently if you had a chance to redo it? Um, first thing, I didn't know when I was in school that you could substitute teach while still in school. And I had friends that were like, oh, yeah, I already know these people because I sub for them every now and then. What? You can do that? And so I spent, you know, I wish I would have known that because maybe I would have gotten a foot in the door earlier than I did. So if if you're going into education, uh, find a school that, hey, you don't have class on Tuesday, Thursday, uh, sub Tuesday and Thursday. The pay is garbage. You get treated like garbage. But it teaches you how to deal with uh, various situations and uh, you get your foot in the door to, at a potential job in the future. Also, um, and you can do that no matter what your major. We had a student who was a journalism major a few seasons ago that he went, he didn't have class on Fridays. So you'd go back home to the home district and, and substitute teach every Friday. And they were actually desperate for teachers at that point. So he got paid pretty well, made a couple hundred bucks for, you know, work at throwing worksheets at people over the course of a day. So not a bad part-time job if you're a college student, even if you're not an ed major. So yeah, that it uh it's surprising. I think things have changed a little bit. When I was when I was doing it, it was sixty dollars a day, which wasn't great, but um I mean you didn't do much. I, I volunteered, I'm a you know I was secondary, so I volunteered for uh elementary, which seems weird. But um, they gave you lesson plans. You did stuff with the kids. It wasn't the quintessential sit behind a desk and watch the same movie over and over again. Um, so that was good. Um, and then I had some friends that were full time teachers. And so when I would sub for them, they'd let me teach because they knew I was certified. But yeah, if you can start early, start early. Um, also, um, be willing to don't you get a certification to teach in Missouri. Also. Also apply for a certification. A lot of states have reciprocity. So get one for Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, um, South Dakota. Alabama has a, a lot of need for, for good quality teachers. Be willing to move. I heard this a lot. Go to Alaska because they have this, you know, they have a, a retirement program. You can start pulling out of the retirement after 10 years. But a lot of states do that anyways. So um, you don't have to end up in Nome, Alaska if you don't want to. 
Um, but Alaska is a great place to go too, because I had some friends that did that for 10 years and uh, they came back and pulled from their retirement while teaching at a new place. Um, be willing to move. Um, and this was probably the best advice that I ever got. And it was from my mentor when I was when I was student teaching. Um, he told me one day, I remember I had some students, I was just starting to do my, uh, my subbing or my uh, student teaching with, with my first class. And I was trying to be relevant to them and not necessarily cool, but chit chat, friendish, that kind of thing. And he pulled me aside and he said to me, it's easier to be mean and get nicer than to start out nice and get meaner. And you can't be afraid. They're not your friends. If they were, that would be weird <laughs> and likely illegal. So don't make them your friend. Um, you need to be the adult in the room and you need to set the rules. It doesn't mean you have to be super strict. I found uh, I, my students performed best when I had one simple rule and it was give respect, you get respect. Everything else comes from that. And uh, and I never, I, I, I had some problems, obviously. Also, um, behavioral stuff aside, if you have a problem student, and, and a teacher tells you about a problem student, don't hold that against them. I had a student where my in, the ISS teacher, in-school suspension teacher at my school came in and said, hey, let me look at your roll sheet and I'll let you know if you have any problem children. And I was like, okay. And he looked at it and he pointed at one. He goes, oh, you're going to have a lot of problems with this one. And I went in with this preconceived notion that this that this was a uh, a, a a bad, a poorly behaved child. And, um, I, th that, that impacted the way I approached that student for the rest of the year. And it wasn't until the last couple of months of that year that I said that I, 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 I realized I should have handled this differently, that I, co I became combative immediately rather than having a conversation with the child. Um, and she, I think she needed that. And so anyways, that's my advice. Good advice. Great advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any uh, advice? Well, well, while we're on an advice topic here, any advice in terms of um, how to search for jobs or how to do like maybe interview tips or um, any really job searching and or getting related advice that you have? Well, this is just a general thing on interviews. Uh, uh, you're going to get asked to the interview because you're qualified. So um, what's going to make you stand out, which sounds crazy, but the is whether or not they like you. And and because, you know, the a career is different than getting a job at a restaurant. I was in the restaurant business for seven years and I got every job that I ever applied for because of my experience, um, except for the first one we had a family friend that knew the guy who owned it that was different but after that it was oh you worked at this place okay you're hired uh but when you're applying for a career that's a that's a that's a long-term choice by that company or by that uh, organization to hire you and so um i think this doesn't help relax people before they go into interviews but <laughs> no pressure uh, yeah but if you're just if you you approach it from a friendly position. You deal obviously with questions in a professional way, but um, you know, just remember that if you don't know the answer, don't lie to them. It, there's ways to approach uh, a question without knowing the answer to it in a way that doesn't make you look stupid, and but also realize it allows the other person to realize hey this person is willing to accept that they're not the most knowledgeable person on this subject um so i don't know just uh trying to be as as um relatable and likable i think is the best thing for an interview but that that i don't know how much that's gonna help somebody get a job but, um, i think that's good advice though because honestly some of the most like cringy terrible interviews i've ever been a part of someone hasn't really known an answer but has made it up and is going to push through and pretend that they know and 
sometimes all you have to say is, you know, I don't know, but I'd really be willing to learn. And that's enough. So I think, you know, even just a little bit of humility is sometimes all that you need in those. Yeah. And, and you can always turn it into ahead. a negative, into a positive. Absolutely. Like um, as far as searching for jobs, my, my area of knowledge is geography based jobs. Um, and, um, uh, so if you were to apply for a geography job, uh, the American Association of Geographers um, is our big organization, AAG. I think there's also like a like a retirement um, organization called AAG. So not to be confused with that, <laughs> but uh, the American Association of Geographers has a website that's set up so that you can break down search terms and it's uh just a wealth of knowledge but not just that usa jobs has that uh same thing as well be willing to move um, if you're willing to move that really does help but getting a job there's all kind you go to indeed there's all kinds of these websites that are available to, to look for jobs so me telling you to go to aag isn't going to make any difference unless you're looking for gis or uh or cartography or those types of related jobs, environmental studies, things like that. But I think um, using professors as resources is probably the best thing you can do. Um, for example, I got uh, I got the scholarship at, at UNCG because the head of the department there uh, was a was an acquaintance with the head of the department at my alma mater. Um, I was able to, um, I got a job offer and, uh, for a, a visiting lecture position at the University of Denver. Um, I got that, I got offered that position because the guy who was interviewing me knew uh, two of the people in my department at UNCG. Um, I didn't accept the job, um, but because I got a better offer, but if you can use those resources, that really does help. And and just don't do what I did going through college, just showing up to class and and not not getting to know your professors because they're a wealth of knowledge. And worst case scenario, they don't know anybody, that, but they can write you a, a fine letter of recommendation. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. The same thing we tell students every day. <laughs> yeah, it's always nice to hear it from somebody else, though. So, well, thank you so much. We appreciate your time today. And thanks for being a guest on the show. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. No, I appreciate you having me. This was fun. All right. Well, that will do it for another episode of Behind the Bearcat. And we'll talk to you next time. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, be sure to give us a thumbs up below. That helps out. Also, if you've not done so yet, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss a new episode. Also, we'd love to connect with you on social media. You can find Behind the Bearcat on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Plus, the audio podcast comes out on Fridays on all the major podcast platforms. Thanks again for watching Behind the Bearcat. And as always, we'll talk to you next time.